So we are really pleased today to have here uh, with us uh, Sir Michel Marmot. Um, professor Marmot is a professor of epidemiology and public health at the University College of London. He's the director of the UCL Institute of Health Inequality and even is a, a chair of the Commission of, on Social Determinants of Health at the World Health Organization. Welcome, Professor Marmot. Thank you. So, Professor Marmot, in uh, February 2020, was published uh, Health Inequality in England, the Marmot, the Marmot Review, 10 years on. Which are the key messages and why it should be relevant for Italy? In 2010, we published the Marmot Review, uh, a Fair Society, Healthy Lives. And it was looking at what you could do to reduce health inequalities. The 2020 report, Health Equity in England, the Marmot Review 10 years on, was looking back at what had happened to health and health inequalities, and indeed the social determinants of health. And we saw three features of health that were very worrying. The first was life expectancy improvement had slowed down dramatically. The second was health inequalities were increasing. And the third was that life expectancy for the poorest people outside London was going down, was getting worse. And our general assumption is that health tells us something about the nature of society. So if health has stopped improving, it means society has stopped improving. If health inequalities are increasing, it means inequalities in society are increasing. Now, Italy didn't do as badly as the UK in the slowdown of life expectancy. I think it did slow the improvement in Italy, but not as much as the UK. But you have persisting health inequalities in Italy. And so I think the findings of both our 2010 and 2020 review are highly relevant to Italy. And we identified six causes of inequalities in health that should be the basis for action. First, early child development. Second, education and lifelong learning. Third, employment and working conditions. Unemployment is bad for health, but so is poor quality work. Fourth, having at least the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. Fifth, healthy and sustainable places in which to live and work, including housing. And the sixth, taking what I call a social determinants approach to prevention. In other words, in other words, not just telling people about smoking and drinking and diet and obesity, but looking at the social determinants of those behaviors. Most of those got worse over the 10 year period from 2010. And I think those domains are highly relevant to Italy. Thanks. And uh, so the pandemic era strike the national health systems and economy of all countries, especially the Western one. How is the crisis, the crisis affecting health inequalities? We said at the beginning of the pandemic that it would expose the underlying inequalities in society and amplify them. And we've got very good data from Britain. So let me talk about the British data, both from England and Scotland. If what we see for all cause mortality pre pandemic is a social gradient, the more deprived the area in which people live, the higher the mortality. That's for all causes pre pandemic. During the pandemic, if we look at the gradient in mortality, we see what we saw pre-pandemic. And then for COVID-19 mortality, it's almost exactly parallel, just at a lower level. In other words, the inequalities in health and the inequalities in COVID-19 share the same set of causes. Now, the 
exaggeration, the amplification of the inequalities in the most deprived two or three deciles on the deprivation index, we see an even higher relative mortality for COVID-19, which we think relates to frontline exposure, exposure to frontline occupations, and living in overcrowded, possibly multi-generational households. So in other words, the pandemic has exposed and amplified inequalities in health, and then lockdown makes the inequalities worse. Yeah, and uh, uh, so, Professor Mamo, in your research, uh, you study the relation between uh, familiar income, education, and health. How uh, are these relations affected by the pandemic scenario, and especially in part you described it uh, just before, uh, and how uh, are they going to evolve in the next years? Well, let me start pre-pandemic. What we saw, take child poverty. A child poverty is defined in a rel relative way as living in a household at less than 60% of median income. In the decade from 2010, before the pandemic, child poverty in England went up. It went up in general, and it went up particularly for single parents, and particularly single parents not in work. But child poverty went up. Then during the pandemic, the socioeconomic inequalities got worse. The lower the household income, the greater the likelihood of being employed in an occupation in an industry that was shut down. So the lower your income, you either had to go out to work in a dangerous occupation to be and be exposed to the virus, or your occupation, your industry was shuttered, was closed down. So white collar, high income people were much more likely to be able to continue work from home. And the lower the income, the less likelihood of that happening. In Britain, we had a furlough scheme, which made up to a maximum of 80% of previous income. But it, it means that if your previous income was close to the poverty line, and now you're getting 80%, you're under the poverty line. So the effect of closure of lockdown was that richer people had their incomes preserved or even increased because they couldn't spend money. Um, if you can't go and attend a football game or a concert or the opera or whatever it is you do, and you can't eat out at restaurants and can't stay in hotels, you can't spend money. And the people working in those industries lost their jobs. So the, the very industries in which pe rich people couldn't spend their money was depriving lower income people of income. So we saw, for example, in Britain, we saw a big increase in food insecurity. People couldn't afford to feed their children. Wow. That's pretty basic in a rich society, not having enough money to feed your children. And that, that nearly doubled during the lockdown. Yeah, even in Italy, we have dramatic data about uh, poverty. So they estimate the score um, one uh, million person more than uh, 2019 in, uh, in poverty. So there are more, more than 5.6 million persons in Italy, a very dramatic situation. Yeah. And so, uh, Mr. Mamo, we even read very, very interesting uh, uh, documents about uh, the Marmo City model. How do you think it should be applied in Italy to sustain health and economy? Oh, I think it could be, it's very applicable. I mean, we did a global commission on social determinants of health, I, which I led for the World Health Organization, and a European review of social determinants in the health divide, 
we've now done two more, one for the Americas and one for the Eastern Mediterranean region. And we've had experts from all around the world advising us. And those six domains that I mentioned are highly relevant to Italy, early child development, education, employment and lifelong learning, having enough money to lead a healthy life, healthy and sustainable places and communities, and taking a social determinist approach to prevention. They're all highly relevant to Italy and other countries. And then the question is, where should the locus of action be? At national government, at regional government, at city government? Well, potentially at each of those levels. And I see great prospect for action at the city level. We, we want action at the national government level. National governments uh, raise taxes, they provide benefits and welfare payments and the like. But there's a lot of scope for action at the city level on those Marmot recommendations. Thanks, very, very interesting. And uh, uh, one last question. Um, Europe, uh, European countries are experiencing an intense discussion about uh, the investment priorities to sustain economy and employment. In your opinion, which are the priorities in terms of public health and education and how they could affect the economy? Well, I, I produced a second report in 2020, which we called Build Back Fairer. And the reason for doing this second report in December 2020 was precisely because of what you and I have just been discussing, the effect of the pandemic on inequalities and the fact that the status quo before the pandemic was far from ideal. So we said, as we emerge from the pandemic, we want to build back fairer very important. And that means rethinking the economy and society. We have had in most Western countries a commitment to the so-called neoliberal model of economics, um, that small state, lack of government action, leave it to the market. And that's potentially been extremely damaging. And really, we need to do something different. And we need to do it in different ways. We need to ask, how does our economy, as we emerge from the pandemic, benefit everybody? At the moment, we've seen growing inequalities, economic inequalities, damage to environments, failure to deal with the climate crisis, and we need a different model as we come out of it. Um, good work for everybody. Everybody should get a living wage. We need to think of the nature of work and how it fits with family life and communities. And we need to give real thought to what the indicator of success should be. For too long, the indicator of success has been gross domestic product. We think, I think, it should be equity of health and well being. That should be the measure of success. So we should look at those six domains that I've mentioned twice, and we should be taking action on those with the outcome to create the kind of societies that increase equity the fair distribution of health and well-being. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Marmo, uh, Sir Marmo, uh, for the time spent with us. It's very, very important, uh, the, the vision you, you share with us. Thanks, and we hope to uh, listen again uh, your uh, your ideas and your vision. Thanks. My pleasure, and thank you.